Next up, we have Andrew Buxton. He's the Managing Director of Alice Queen. I love the name of this company, ASX Code, AQX. Over to you, Andy. Let's uh, hear the Alice Queen story. Fantastic. Thanks, Kerry. Or I'll get straight into it. I think we're on limited time. So um, I think what I've organised here is just to do about a minute per slide, and there's about 13 slides just to let the, the viewers know. Um, a little bit about the corporate overview. Um, currently capped at about 20 million. It's been as high as 50 over the recent uh, recent uh, six months or so. Uh, so right now we've experienced a little bit of a downturn, um, and I think basically because of the gold price. So hopefully the gold price, um, and I'm sure a lot of your viewers will see this, is hopefully bottoming out and turning at the moment, and we see some pretty good times ahead. Um, market cap 20 mil, as I mentioned. One thing I always mention about this slide for your viewers is that. Um, our major shareholders are twofold. One is um, a guy called Chris Morris, who's the founder of Computer Share, yeah. um, who has some interests up in up in North Queensland. So, um, not necessarily a mining guy, of course, but uh, a very good guy and a very smart guy, and he's been really helpful to us over the years. Um, the other one is Emmanuel Dat, who's a you know a very well credentialed uh, investment manager who runs Dat Capital, and each of those guys has about seven or eight percent. So. Um, good supporters and, yeah, really smart guys to have behind us, which is fantastic. Um, the projects themselves, there are three major project areas, and this is a very simple slide just to show you where they are. I mean, Horn Island is our flagship. That's the one that's, um, you know, the, the furthest developed. Um, that just sits on a small uh, small atoll just off the tip of Cape York, uh, and we're entering into a scoping study there uh, at the moment and hopefully see some near-term production opportunities in the next year or so. Um, Lachlan Foldbelt, or the, the Molong projects in central New South Wales, we're chasing giant copper gold porphyries there. We'll talk a bit about that today. And then most recently, we've won a couple of really good projects over in Fiji after uh, what amounted to be about four years' worth of work, two years in earnest, we finally won a couple of great licenses in Fiji. And we'll talk a bit about Fiji because I think a lot of the viewers may not know that Fiji is a great address for gold. And I'll talk about that today and why they're so good. Um, the target, sort of the goals in each of these locations are pretty simple. I've just mentioned them, but to progress towards development over the next 18 to 24 months at Horn, um, to make a major discovery, obviously, in central New South Wales. And we all know that um, um, the boat of discovery recently made by Alcane was one of those type of things. And that's, that's the sort of thing that we'll be aiming to do in New South Wales. Uh, and then Fiji. Fiji's got a really unique opportunity that comes with a, you know, a, like a 20-year history of exploration. Um, and in fact, off the record, comes with a resource that was previously published some years ago that wasn't chalk compliant. So one of the things we're really going hard at there is to get that existing historic data into a chalk compliant situation. So we can announce not only the previous exploration results, but hopefully a resource there. Okay, so not item number one, Horn Island, let's get into it. A um, little bit of a map that shows you the location. So um, the, the, the bottom right-hand corner of your screen there is the tip of Cape York. Uh, and this is really Australia's northernmost outpost. So um, there are a number of islands in the southern part of the Torres Strait um, that really we call Kaiwalagal. And um, yeah, we've got permits over about five of those islands. In red, you can see our main tenement there is Horn Island, and that's what I'll be talking most about today. But it's important for your viewers to understand that it's not just Horn Island that we've got up there. We've got tenure over uh, a number of other islands, including the biggest island in the Torres Strait, which is known as Muralug, or Prince of Wales Island, which you can see pictured just to the, to the left there of Horn. Now, one of the things that, um, you know, really excited us when we first saw this place is that it sounds like it's a long way away, and it is. Um, as I mentioned, Australia's northernmost outpost. However, when we got there, we were quite surprised to the upside that what we didn't realise was that um, given its geopolitical uh, importance to Australia and to the government of Australia and to the government of Queensland, it's incredibly well endorsed with infrastructure, existing infrastructure. And this slide or this picture is designed to show you that um, the mine site itself, or sorry, the other key, the key thing I should mention is that the Horn Island Gold Mine is an historic gold mine that operated for a couple of years uh, in the mid to late 80s. And so some of this infrastructure was built for that mine. Um, it didn't go that well. It went, went, actually went, went broke um, under some really poor management uh, back in the 80s when the gold price collapsed on them. Um, but the key thing here is that the mine site is just to, on the far end of the island, as you can see there. And if you look around, you've got the Horn Island Airport, uh, about 3k away, which is serviced twice daily by 
Qantas Link out of Cairns. Um, you've got a deep water port down the bottom left there, uh, which is serviced three times a week out of Cairns by a company called Sea Swift. You've got a town of 700 people at Wasaga. Um, you've got all weather roads, etc. So realistically, um, although it sounds remote, Kerry, one of the things that really has played into, into the, uh, the opportunity here is that we're actually much better placed uh, in many ways to get a mine up and running here than you would be in the western deserts of Queensland or indeed in the central deserts of Australia. Um, because of that existing infrastructure. The main that, hub sorry, Andrew, is that existing infrastructure still in reasonably good shape or is there a lot of work to be done with it? No, it's all in, all in perfect shape. I mean, the, oh. the ones that I'm putting out are, are all designed to service the region of the Torres Strait. So without getting into too much detail, situated directly across the channel that you can see in the front of the, of the picture there is the centre of Thursday Island. And that's like, the, if you like, the capital city of the Torres Strait. It's, it's 3,500 people. It's got, believe it or not, 35 government departmental offices on <laughs> TI. Uh, and there are 17 remote communities in the Torres Strait that are all serviced by, by um, the administration hub at, at TI, but also by the uh, infrastructure hub at Horn. So if you want to go to the Torres Strait, um, you have to fly in via Horn Island. You ferry across to TI if you want to go there. But you, from Horn Island Airport, you can fly anywhere in the Torres Strait um, and so forth. So all of that infrastructure exists to support the local communities of the Torres Strait, and it's all government funded. So it's in tip-top shape. Um, the roads, I mean, just while well, we're on the topic, the roads service uh, the mine site because part of the old historic mine got turned into the council tip. So there are all the roads there because the dump trucks go in and out there you know, every day, servicing, taking the rubbish from, from TI over to the, to, the, to the landfill on Horn. So, yeah, all, that infrastructure, all the infrastructure you can see there is in tip-top shape and supported and funded um, by the governments of Queensland and the governments of Australia. Okay, now just a quick, quick slide about the upside here at Horn Island. Um, this one's something that goes into a bit of detail, but I'll keep this really simple for your viewers. Um, the picture you're seeing there is Horn Island replicated four times, obviously. That tiny little red dot there is our current resource, uh, published resource of about half a million ounces, and that's the surface image of that resource in the old mine site. Um, we've done some significant work around what's the, the metal footprint, if you like, uh, of Horn Island compared to some of the other well-known and very successful um, your mines in Queensland of a similar nature. And they're all listed here, and I won't go through all of them, but really the point of this story is our metal footprint is significant. It's almost bigger than the metal footprint of Ravenswood. The ore deposit at Ravenswood's clearly bigger, um, but that's a seven million ounce deposit, and that's been operating for some 20 years or thereabouts. So really what we're trying to say in this slide is that it's not just the little bit that we've explored so far. This island is a 35 square kilometre mineral field that we're really just, just, just starting at. Um, and we're, we're sitting on a half million ounces. We hope to improve on that over, over the years ahead. Um, and sorry. And uh, yeah, the first step of that is to get uh, the scoping study finished on the bit that we know is there. And hopefully we get a mine up and running and we can continue on with our exploration of other parts of the island over coming years. Uh, when's the scoping study due? Good question. Yeah, so it's due July. At this stage, we're on track. We're about sort of halfway through it. Okay. Yep. Uh, there are a couple of other things that perhaps are worthy of mentioning. One is um, there are a couple of um, obviously key studies that feed into the total um, document of the scoping study. Um, things like uh, metallurgy, there'll be a couple of reports on that in there. Um, one of the exciting ones which we announced this morning, which some of your viewers might have seen, is the Tomra ore sorting results. Um, now, again, I won't go into too much detail, but Tomra is this unique... Um, global technology, a global company now, uh, that's able to sort waste rock from ore. And in this deposit, we have um, this very fortunate situation where all of the gold's contained in the sulphide veins and there's no gold in the, in the host rock. So it's very amenable to this new technology that's sort of sweeping the mining industry around the world. Um, in fact, it's one of the best types of deposits for that technology. So those results are fantastic. And the basic principle is it reduces your waste rock and therefore lifts the grade that you're feeding into your mill. And those numbers, you can check the announcement out, they're significant for us. Uh, and that'll play into you know, what we hope to be a really great result on the scoping study. So that ultimately reduces the costs of mining, is that correct? 
That's it, exactly. Yeah, I mean the, the big costs are you know obviously mining the mining the rock and then putting it through the plant or the mill, and so yeah, wherever you can get rid of waste, um, you know, significant waste rock rather than putting it through the mill, you're, you're miles ahead. Yeah. Uh, and that report that, um, as I say, your viewers can go and check out on ASX. That's got all the details uh, about how good this is going to be for our for our plans. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's all going to work just yet. We'll wait for the scoping study to confirm all of those things, but. What it should tell you is that we're off to a really good head start with that technology working. Did you, um, you, you, uh, and we don't have a lot of time, so I can't, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you had a joint venture with some Barbara up here. Um, they're no longer involved. Has that changed anything for you, Andrew? Yeah, that's a good question. Look, I think it's one of those ones, isn't it? We've, we spent two years um, negotiating the deal. We then spent a year and a half with them, um, you know, spending. $2.6 million worth of their money up there. Um, and of course, it was disappointing that they left. Um, our, our, their rationale for doing so is not exactly clear to me. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. after the initial disappointment of a couple of days, I, I very quickly got my head around, so was our board of directors, got a head around the fact that um, this is a huge opportunity that we're now, we've got back effectively. And we're unconstrained in all sorts of things now that we were constrained uh constrained in when we had St Barbara there and of course as these results for the scoping study become more and more clear to us we get more and more excited and I think more and more satisfied that we haven't, actually haven't lost anything we're probably actually in a better position. you've probably so, gained something and they might come back saying can we come back and you'll be like no nah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no that's right okay yeah, so well, we've only got about uh, eight minutes left so let's yeah, uh, make no sure worries. we crack on no worries all right moving straight along to New South Wales Look, I can skim through most of this because I think um, there is a great story about John Holliday. He's our chief technical advisor here. And again, for those viewers that uh, don't know this guy, he discovered one of Australia's biggest gold mines, Acadia Ridgeway, which is pictured down at the bottom end of that chart there, um, or that map there. Um, that's basically become a, or, you know, one of the best, most profitable gold mines in the world. And so when we set up Alice Queen back in 2012, he was my first uh, go-to man and became my first partner in, in the company. And he's remained our chief technical advisor ever since. And with a discovery like that under your belt, he spent 30 years at Newcrest. And I suppose what we're really saying here in New South Wales is we're chasing the giant deposits, okay, like Cadia Valley. That's what we're trying to find. And the simple principle here is that um, these things are expensive to drill. They are, um, they're deep. Um, uh, they're hard to find. But if you do find one, it's, a, you know, it's a huge result for the company. So, uh, long odds, but huge reward if we do find something. And we reckon we've got the best guy in the business um, guiding us on a technical basis through where to, where to, where to look for these things. And so he wouldn't be your chief technical advisor if he didn't believe that you were along the same sort of volcanic belt and there was a bloody good chance. Would that be, would that be wrong, right, in saying that? I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could, I could go on with the story. But, yeah, but his view is that it's my long volcanic belt. Um, if you take that on a global scale, there should be more than one Cadia Valley. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of examples around the world. The Chilean belt's got at least a dozen or more of these giant, you know, world-class copper gold porphyries. The Indo-Pacific belt through, you know, New Guinea and uh, Indonesia's got another dozen of them. And John's view has always been, well, there shouldn't be just one on this belt. There sh should be more than one. And he reckons that um, pretty much everyone's explored the southern part within an inch of its life. So the northern part should contain something pretty good somewhere. And that's where we pegged, as you can see, all of our ground on his advice. So, yeah, we're getting through that. And there's some results that have been uh, announced previously. And we've got another bunch that have just come in um, last Friday. So I think um, those shareholders that are getting a little bit um, frustrated in terms of time, I completely accept that. But the results are coming in uh, thick and fast now. We'll have some announcements out on that um, probably in the next week or two. Um, just touching on each of the tenements within our package, Mindurin is a great story because Newcrest came into that and then went out again, same sort of thing as Sir Barbara, um, spent a million dollars on their target generation and we seem to be the beneficiary of that now. We've drilled two holes in the southern end of it. Um, the government of New South Wales has given us a grant of 200000 to go towards the drilling costs there. So everyone's very supportive. Those two holes are done. Results are coming in as we speak and we'll have an announcement out about those two uh, holes in, in, a, in a week or two. Yeah, Jury, I might skip over this because there's a lot of information here, but it does get a bit technical. But suffice yeah. to say, we've drilled a you know, half dozen or so holes. There's been some little sniffs, um, some quite good sniffs, in fact, uh, but nothing you could yet describe as a discovery. So we'll be following that up in due course. 
And then the one that's been talked about a lot lately is Boater East. Um, you know, obviously, our came had a big discovery there, um, or discovery hole at least. It was a thousand meters at half a gram gold. And if you viewers don't know what that means, that's you know, that is a huge, huge intercept. Um, they're now trying to find the higher grade bits of that deposit to make it sort of hang together as a, as a commercial opportunity. Um, and look, they're you know, they're going pretty aggressively and fingers crossed because anything that they do successfully will hopefully um, give us a little bit of advantage because we're right next door to them there. Um, just quickly, we've done 10 holes. We have announced seven of them. The other three, again, as I mentioned, just came in last week. So we'll be announcing those results in due course probably over the next week or so. Um, and that's really the story there. And then from all that, once we've got all the information in, the idea is to use that to vector to try and work out where to go next. Uh, and then so, of course, once we've, got, once we've done all that um, analysis, we'll then be announcing a, you know, a follow-up program of some description in New South Wales. Now, I probably only got a couple of minutes left. How does that sound? Yep. Right, so Fiji, I better get into it. So Fiji, there's one quick thing to say about Fiji. We announced this, uh, whatever it was, a month or two ago, and the phraseology that we used in the announcement, I think was in hindsight probably not quite right. We announced it as an acquisition. Um, technically, it was an acquisition of a shell, and but the, the key point is we actually have spent two, between two and four years working on these tenements to, to actually win them, uh, genuinely win them as new tenements from the government. Once we got the success of winning them, we then... Um, you know, we were required to acquire a company in Fiji to make to facilitate those uh, those operations into a, a Fiji domicile company. So, whereas I think it sounded like we made an acquisition for for peanuts, as someone has recently said to me, it's actually not like that at all. We acquired a shell for peanuts to fulfil our obligations of being able to operate these tenements in Fiji. So that's the first thing. The second thing is just probably very, very quickly, Fiji, if you don't know. Um, has one of the great gold mines of the world situated right at the top there, um, Batacula. Produced 7 million ounces over its life so far and has another, I think, three and a half in reserve. So that's a 10 million ounce operation. And um, it's with that backdrop that, you know, your viewers have got to understand that Fiji is not just a holiday destination, it's a gold destination and, it, and it's a real one. Um, our two tenements, uh, Nabila and Viani, I'll talk mostly just quickly about um, Nimbula. I mean, it's got a historic resource, as I mentioned before, that's not JORC compliant, uh, but we've got a team on the ground there that's already doing the desktop work to bring all of that um, historic data into uh, a JORC compliant fashion, which hopefully will allow us to announce some exploration results historically and reconstitute that resource, which effectively for us would become a maiden resource. Um, which is a great way to start without any drilling and without any real um, <coughs> significant expenditure. Um, now, the other key story here, which is interesting, is that between uh, Nambila and Batacula, along the same geological structure, uh, there's an operation called Tavatu, which is a, um, which is a, I think, seven or eight hundred thousand ounce deposit that's operated by a company called Lion One, which recently listed on the Australian Stock Exchange jointly with the TSX. Um, they're capped at about 200 mil, but they should be in production in the next year or two as well. So you've got real money coming in from overseas. Um, you've got a great operation that's literally just on the other side of the Nandy Airport, as you can see there. Um, and we'll be talking to them in due course about all sorts of other opportunities that we might be able to do together. So we're pretty excited about Fiji. We're going to start with an initial maiden resource, hopefully in six months or so, uh, and then we'll follow up some exploration in more traditional terms um, post that. Um, so that's really about the summary. I'll just quickly go to news flow just, just to close it out. If that's all right, Kerry. I mean, yep. what we've got here is we've already said this, but just so everyone's clear on what's about to happen, um, we've got some results from the infill program we announced actually during the week. Everyone would have seen that. Um, they're fantastic. They're better than the first half. So that will feed nicely into the model that ultimately gets fed into the scoping study. So check out those results we announced earlier in the week. They're, they're really bloody good. Um, the to the Tomra test work, which came out this morning, um, again, check that out. But that, that's a huge change in how this thing will operate and how the scoping study could, could work. Uh, metallurgy, um, updating, updated resources, all that sort of stuff will come from that. And that's over the next sort of month or two, all leading to the culmination of all this work, which is sometime in July for the results of the scoping study itself. Um, and then, as I mentioned, in New South Wales, we've got the, the three holes from Boater East, uh, being processed at the moment in terms of announcements. And we've got the two holes in Mandurin that will be a day or two either side of that announcement at some point very, very soon. 
Uh, and then I'm starting to lose my voice. I'm talking so quickly. Then Fiji, um, yes, it's a review of historical data and the really the target there, Kerry, is to get to a maiden resource without spending too much money in the, in the, in the next few months. Andy Buxton, we have run out of time. There's a lot to go there. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, they've done a fantastic job. There's massive amounts of news flow. Make sure that you check them out. ASX code AQX. Andrew Buxton from Alice Queen, thanks for joining us on the Virtual Gold Conference. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks so much. ABC Bullion, the Australian bullion company. Trading since 1972, ABC Bullion is Australia's largest independent bullion dealer and precious metals depository. Fully insured and verified by independent audit. ABC Bullion offers a range of proprietary investment products and storage solutions at Australia's first gold and silver accumulation plan. ABC Bullion.